Amen. Um, there's just so many good things in that song. I don't know if you're paying attention to the words we actually sang there, but the, there's just so much truth in it and so much that goes along with this series uh, that we've been doing. Um, we sang, my hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. You know, I, I, I see us singing that, and, and the question keeps coming back to, do we take God at his word? Do we live that out during the week? Is Christ really our hope? Is our faith really built on him, or is it built on something else? It says, through the storm, he is Lord, Lord of all. Through the storms, God is the Lord. He's in charge. When things are going well in our life, he's in charge. When things are crashing down around us, he's still in charge. When darkness seems to hide his face, I rest on his unchanging grace. During the times when it just seems dark and bleak out there, I rest on his unchanging grace. He is Lord, Lord of all. You know, that's what it comes down to uh, with every part of our lives. We're finishing up a series on finances now, but in every part of our lives, we need to live that out, the words that we just sang to God this morning in worship. And so we are going to um, finish this off. And it's, it, we're finishing off this series on, on taking God at his word and finances. And I'll tell you what, it's, it's been an enjoyable sermon series for me um, just because I, like I said last week, I've just heard more stuff, um, the really good and the really bad. And so there are people that hate me and people that love me. And it's just kind of enjoyable, you know, because I'm just, I'm, I'm usually the good guy. And so to be the hated guy every once in a while is not too bad. Um, but I'm just preaching God's word. I'm just telling you what God says. And uh, like I said, the results are mixed, and some people just don't want to be a part of it. But some people are making some incredible changes in their lives. And they're saying, you know what? I used to live like this, but I need to really change. And, and it's a big step for them. And it's, it's fearful. And you can see them. You can hear them say, I'm afraid to do this. But they're taking those steps anyway. And to me, that's incredible. That is just incredible. It's exciting. It's what we're supposed to do. It's what we're called to do. And so this morning, we're going to be looking at uh, a passage uh, in the Bible from Matthew chapter 7. Uh, if you don't have a Bible, there should be one of the chairs in front of you. Uh, it's page 686 in those Bibles. Uh, if you have your iPhone or tablet, you can find Matthew pretty easily. If you brought your own Bible, uh, Matthew is in the New Testament. It's the first book of the New Testament. So it's about three-fourths of the way through the Bible. Uh, Matthew, right before the books of Mark and Luke. Matthew chapter 7, and what's going on here is Jesus is preaching the Sermon on the Mount. It's probably the most famous sermon that, that he has done. And he, he's preached and said, okay, in the past you guys have heard this is how you're supposed to live. This is what the Old Testament says, but I'm taking it up a notch. I'm raising the standard, I'm raising the bar, and this is the expectations now in this New Testament, this New Covenant. And as Jesus has said, okay, here's the old and here's the new, and, and what, he, what he does at the end of his sermon is, is he puts out a, a decision, a, a challenge to the people and says, you're going to have to figure out which way you're going to live here. You're going to have to figure out if you're going to live your way or if you're going to live God's way. And so in Matthew chapter 7, uh, start, I'll start reading with verse 24, and Jesus sums up his sermon by saying this, therefore, Everyone who hears these words of mine and puts them into practice is like a wise man who built his house on the rock. The rain came down, the streams rose, and the winds blew and beat against that house. Yet it did not fall because it had its foundation on the rock. But everyone who hears these words of mine and does not put them into practice is like a foolish man who built his house on sand. The rain came down, the streams rose, and the winds blew and beat against that house, and it fell with a great crash. Now, Jesus was a carpenter, so he knew a little bit about building houses and things like that, and he knew about the, the foundations that were necessary. He was a carpenter in Israel, and Israel has a couple of rainy seasons. And so there may be this area over here that looks dry and nice, but during the rainy season, it may come through and wash out anything that's on there. Because there's no big foundation there. It's all just sand. But if you were to build something, a, a, a foundation, uh, a, a house on a solid foundation, then when those storms came every year, twice a year, then that structure would stand. Now, I'm going to be talking about finances this morning. 
But if you are looking at your life, there's a lot of different places you can apply this in your life. So um, make the transition, okay? But we're talking about finances, finishing this sermon series, and, and we're talking about this. Building a financial house starts by listening to God. It starts by listening to God. Here in the Sermon on the Mount, at the end of the sermon, it's the conclusion, and Jesus says this, Therefore, everyone who hears these words of mine, everyone who hears these words, I'll tell you what, as a preacher, I have to keep putting it in our hearts. I have to keep putting it in our heads. I have to keep saying this. You've got to get into God's word. You have to learn God's word. Um, The Bible, that's God's word to us. And so God is trying, he wants to share things with us, but if we don't get into the Bible, we're not going to learn things. You know, this is God's word. This is the primary way that he speaks to us is through the Bible. And so as a church, we need to do that. And I understand, and I, I, I don't know how many times I could say this, I understand when you read the Bible, it may be hard, it may be complicated. There may be things you don't understand. I understand that. I would encourage you to go online. Go to a website like EnduringWord.com or BibleGateway.com. And when you're reading a passage of Scripture, they've got some little comments there to help you understand the things that you just read. Um, Especially over the next couple weeks, I, I would encourage you to do that. Beyond that, as a church, we have been giving out these books, Take God at His Word. It is a biblical perspective on finances. There are still some left on the chair back there and on the table back there. We're trying to read chapter four this week. They're they're there for you to understand what God's word says about finances. In the back, I noticed that someone has taken one of the Dave Ramsey books, read it, and they brought it back. So there's one available back in the back. If you still have trouble reading, go online, look at video sermons, but you've got to get into God's word. And I can tell you what, I can tell a difference in my life when I'm not reading God's word. When I'm not spending time either directly in the Bible or with books that talk about the Bible, there's a difference in my life. I'm not as focused on God, and I'm studying the Bible every week. And so Jesus says, those who hear my word, you've got to listen to God. You've got to listen to God so you understand what's going on, not just with your finances, but in the world around you. I mean, there are some really cool movies that have the potential to come out uh, really soon. There's a film on Noah that's coming out, or that came out just recently. I didn't think it was a great show. Um, And then when I watched the show uh, in general, you know, it didn't match up with what the Bible says. I wasn't angry about that because they said ahead of time, uh, when they were promoting Noah, they were saying things like, yeah, it's not exactly to the script of the Bible. Uh, there's a, a movie coming out real soon called Exodus, Gods and Kings. Uh, looks like a really cool, epic show. Is it going to be biblical and exactly with what the Bible says? Yeah, I doubt it. I doubt it. But what it does is it gives us a picture of, okay, here's maybe what the time period looked like. Uh, and then I'm going to just say this. You know what? If you're going to go watch that show, which I would encourage you to do just to get some visuals of what it could have looked like, Go back and read Exodus. Read the first few chapters of Exodus so that when you go into the movie theater, you can watch and go, man, they really messed that one up. (laughs) Okay? And because some of your friends, some of your family members, they may go see it. And they may go just see, and and everything that they see in there, they're going to come to you and say, wow, I didn't know that God did this. And you're like, well, I didn't either. (laughs) And then you read the Bible and say, well, he didn't. That's not at all what the Bible says. But how do you know unless you read the Bible. Because there's a lot of things that swim around our heads that someone has told us at some point, this is what the Bible says. We go and look in the Bible, it's not there. You know, there, there was a miniseries last year sometime, a year and a half ago, the Bible miniseries. And I thought it was incredible that they were getting people to go and, and kind of look into the Bible. I thought it was one of the worst things ever, biblically. <laughs> I mean, they promoted themselves as, this is what the Bible says. And there were so many things messed up. How do I know that? I was reading the Bible. And if there were things I didn't understand there, guess what? I could check them against God's word. There are so many things in this world that are partial truth. The, the, the flat out lies, those are easy to deal with. But there's a lot of stuff that's kind of mixed in there, some truth, some not. And pulling those strings apart can be really hard 
if you're not in God's word. You know, when it comes to the finances in this series, the world's plan is this. Everything I make is mine. I need more things. That's what every commercial is on TV telling us. <laughs> you are not happy in your life because you don't have this. And so I need to go buy those more things. Uh, I, you know what? Not only should I buy them, I should buy them now, even if I can't afford them. I need to spend 110% of what I earn, and this credit card debt, $15,000 worth of, that's just a part of life. That's the world's plan for finances, guys, and it's messed up. And there's a lot of people that are hurting there. God's plan, we've been talking about God's plan over the last few weeks. Number one, we remember God owns it all. Everything that's in this universe, even the, the, the money that's in your pocket right now, God owns it all because he made it all. But God has also made us managers. He said, okay, I've made this all, but I'm going to trust you with some of that. And I expect you to manage that. Part of the management is, God says, we need to give to him first. We give to him the first of our income. The results in running God's way, <laughs> there's a lot less stress in life. <laughs> there's a lot more confidence in knowing that you're doing the right thing. There's a lot of trust in God. You know that you're doing the things that he's calling you to do. James 4, 17 says this. Anyone then who knows the good he ought to do and doesn't do it, sins. Everyone who knows the good he ought to do and doesn't do it, sins. We've got an issue with that passage of scripture. We were in life groups this week, and we were going over one of the parables that Jesus taught, and it ta talks about how this ma master gave his three servants a sum of money, and they were supposed to do something with it. And when the master came back, he said, he's talked to the first two, and they said, hey, you gave me this much, I, I, I doubled it, here you go. And he talked to the third guy, and the third guy said, you know what, I was afraid. And so I took the money you gave me, and I went and I buried it, and I hid it. And now, here's your money back. And the master in that parable that Jesus tells calls that guy a wicked and lazy servant. Now, we understood the, the lazy part. In, in both of the life groups that I was leading this week, we understood the lazy part. He did nothing. His master said, do something, and he did nothing. The part that both the groups struggled with was, Jesus also called him wicked. And the part they had trouble with was, well, he didn't do anything. I mean, we think of wicked as someone who goes out and does evil things. And Jesus is saying, this guy was wicked because he did nothing with what he was given. James says, if you know the good you ought to do and you don't do it, that's a sin. That's wickedness. Over the last several weeks, we've been talking about what God wants us to do with our finances. If you don't do the things that God tells you to do, if you don't put those things into practice, then you are acting in a wicked way, aren't you? You're sinning against God. And that was hard for our life group people to get through in their heads because we don't like to be called out on things. We don't like it when someone says, well, here's what God's word says, and here's what you're doing, and those things aren't matching. We really don't like that. But God says that we need to build a solid fi financial house. We need to do that by listening to God. And God's way is hard because ultimately, ultimately all this talk about finances, it's about a change inside of us. And honestly, that's hard. It's hard to do. And that's why when you become a Christian, you've got God's Holy Spirit. You've got God's Spirit working in you to help you make those changes. Because a lot of times, most of the time, almost never can we make those changes on our own. We need God's Spirit working in us. And God's for us. He wants to help us to grow and learn these things. We need to build a solid fi financial house by, first of all, listening to God. Second of all, we build that solid financial house by obeying God's word. By obeying God's word. Uh, we listen to it, and then we put it into practice. That's what Jesus said. The, the difference between these two guys, between these two houses, between the two things that are going on there, was not a huge difference. I mean, just when you read the story, therefore everyone who hears these words of mine and puts them into practice, 
Uh, and then on the other side, everyone who hears these words of mine and does not put them into practice. You know, you look at, at the two houses there, they probably use the same building materials. They probably had the same storms. They probably both heard God's word. What was the difference? The difference is one of them put God's word into practice and one of them didn't. And when the storm came, the one who put God's word into practice, his house stood. And when the storms came, the one who didn't put God's word into practice, there was a great crash. Just a simple little difference of the difference between hearing and putting it into practice. Again, James, James tells us and warns us, he says, do not merely listen to the word and so deceive yourselves, but do what it says. Don't merely listen to the word. If all you do is listen to God's word and agree with God's word, you're deceiving yourself. That's what James says. You listen and go, oh man, that's exactly right. I should do those things. And that's where we get trapped. That's where I get trapped. Okay? <laughs> I, I, I listen to God's word. I, I know I should do that. And I agree that that's a great thing to do. And I sit back and go, all right, I'm done but I haven't done it. I haven't put it into practice. And that putting it into practice, that makes all the difference. If you agree that obeying God is a good thing, if you agree that you should tithe, if you make a plan to tithe, but you don't do it, who cares? You still haven't done it. Francis Chan is a preacher, and I remember seeing a video that he did, a sermon, and he talked about his daughter. He said, I told my daughter to go and clean her room. And she came back, you know, a couple hours later. I said, did you clean your room? And she said, no, but, but listen, I, I heard your words, and I went down and I wrote your words down. And then I memorized your words. And I agreed that, that I should clean my room. Isn't that enough? And her dad said, no, you missed the whole point. I want your room clean. It's a pigsty. And agreeing with my words doesn't do any good. So how do we start? How do we start obeying God's word? Here, here's where I would start. If, if, if this is an issue for you, I would start just by figure out what your income is. Figure out what, what you have coming in. Next thing to do, track your spending for a month. Write down every single penny that you spend for an entire month. Okay? If you do that for an entire month, you're going to start to get a picture of where your money goes. At the end of that month, then, put together a budget. Put together a budget of the places you're going to spend your money, where you're going to give to God first, where you're going to save and, and give to yourself second, then when you take care of your needs, and then where you take care of your wants. Put together that spending plan. You know, for some of you guys, it may be using an envelope system where you put cash in different envelopes. Some of you guys are like, I do not want to spend cash. I will totally not take the time. Some of you guys are like, I'm going to use a debit card so I can write. It's, it's, it tracks it for me. I don't care. Doesn't matter. Whatever works for you. Figure out what your income is. Write that down. Figure out where you're spending your money. And that's going to show you where some of the issues are. And then you put together your budget and say, okay, here's where I give to God, give to me, take care of my bills, and then take care of the things that I want. And then figure out how you can live that out, how you can live within your budget. Now, there are obstacles to doing that. <laughs> Number one is people are going to be afraid. If I put in my budget that I give to God first, I don't see how it can work out. And someone's going to bring their, their budget to me, and they're, and they're going to show me all their bills, and they're going to say, see, Brian, I, I don't see how this can work. <laughs> and I'm going to say, you know what? You're exactly right. I don't see how it can work. But that's not my problem. Uh, that, that's God's problem. He's the one that's supposed to take care of these things. Some of you guys are, are sitting here right now, and you're just going to be stubborn, and you're going to say, you know what? I, I'm going to do it my way, and you can't change the way I deal with my finances. Preacher shouldn't be talking about money anyway. Some of you guys are going to be prideful and say, I can do this on my own. I don't need your help. I don't need God's help. I earn this stuff. I'm going to spend it however I want. And my response is, good luck, you know? That's been working for you really well. And so just cut God out of that. It'll be fine. Jesus said that whoever hears these words of mine and puts them into practice, when the storms in life come, their house is going to stand. 
And those who hear his words and don't put them into practice, when the storms of life come, it's going to crash. Man, I'm telling you guys, storms are coming. I don't care who you are. I don't care what your background is. I don't care how you showed up today. There is a storm that's going to happen in the future in your life. I can't tell you what it's going to be, but there's something that's going to happen that's going to threaten to tear your life apart. And if you have the foundation of Jesus Christ in your life, you're going to stand. It may be miserable, but you're going to stand. And it's worth it. Build a solid financial house by listening to God and by obeying his word. And the third principle from this morning is build a solid financial house by starting now. Start now. I mean, what are you waiting for? Are you waiting for the new year? I'll tell you what, if you wait for the new year, you're probably not going to start. If you don't start doing something about this right now, you're going to put it off and think that's something I got to get to. But if you're like me, your to get to list just gets bigger and bigger. It doesn't get smaller. But this needs to be up toward the beginning. I think that God, I think God wants to work in your hearts. I believe that that's what he wants to do. In Hebrews chapter 3, verse 4, um, starting with verse 4, <clears throat> it says this, For every house is built by someone, but God is the builder of everything. Moses was faithful as a servant in all of God's house, testifying to what would be said in the future. But Christ is faithful as a son over God's house. We are his house. If we hold on to our courage and the hope of which we boast, those who are followers of Christ, you are, the, you are the house, the spiritual house. If we hold on to our courage, if we hold on to our courage that we trust and believe in God and the hope of which we boast, we boast about getting to heaven someday. Well, you know what? That's not here yet. So we have to have the courage to live out our faith right now. So, as the Holy Spirit says, today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts. If God is working in your heart, if he's working in your minds, if, if God, if you get these, these promptings from inside of you, from God's spirit, saying, do this, trust me in this, don't harden your hearts. Don't put it off. Don't think, I'll get to that some point. Start now. Because when you start putting things off, bad things happen. You know, during the American Revolution, Colonel Rawl was a commander of the British troops in Trenton, New Jersey. Colonel Rawl was in the middle of a card game with a bunch of his officers. As he was in the middle of this card game, he got an urgent message written on a piece of paper. And that urgent message was brought to him, and he put it in his pocket until the game was done. When he finished playing his card game, he pulled out the note and read that General Washington was on the way there. But by then, it was too late. Washington and his troops had crossed the Delaware, and they took over the town of Trenton. Worked really good for us. <laughs> Not so good for Colonel Rawl. Just putting off that note, just putting off that message, if he wouldn't have done that, he could have avoided the loss. He could have avoided disaster. But because he put it off just for a little while, he lost. When you start to follow God's word in this, I want you to be prepared, okay? I want you to be prepared because you may see immediate blessings. I can't tell you how many times someone has said, you know what, I started giving, Brian, and I, I started giving to God, and then, bam, this stuff just started showing up. It was so cool. And then the other side happens. As soon as you decide, I'm going to start being faithful to God in this area of my life, look to be attacked. And the reason is pretty simple. If you're, if you're walking down a river, Okay, if you're going with the flow of the river, it's pretty easy when you're going with the flow. But when you turn around and try and go against the flow, that gets to be really hard. And what's happening right now, if you're not following God's word, you're going down the path, the river that Satan wants you to go. Okay, he's, he's going to leave you alone because you're going the way he wants you to go. But when you turn around and decide to follow God, Satan's going to do all kinds of things to try and trip you up. Because now you're going the way he doesn't want you to go. And so you may be attacked. You may be, have all kinds of new storms show up in your life. And so you need to be prepared for that because doing God's way and, and, and living for him is, is hard at times. Kyle Eidelman wrote a book and he talks about storms that happen in our life. And he talks about two basic 
principles that happen. Difficult circumstances are one type of storm, and deserved consequences are another type of storm. Difficult circumstances come from the outside. Uh, an economic collapse, uh, economic collapse of an economy, of a country. Uh, maybe a loss of a job through nothing that you did. Maybe a death of a family member. Those are just difficult circumstances that happen in life. And the other type of storms that come are deserved consequences. These are bad things that happen in our life, and they're honestly, they're self-inflicted. Poor choices, bad decisions cause storms in our lives. We probably know some people that have been through storms. Some have withstood those storms. Others have crashed. The difference is it's in the foundation. It's in the foundation. And so start today. Start today. There are different ways that you can give at this church. Uh, in a little while, we'll take up an offering, and you can give cash. Uh, if you want to track that so you can have some record for the IRS, you, there's envelopes in the chairs in front of you, and so you can just fill that out and put that in. Uh, you can give checks in the service. That's another way to give. If you want to give uh, online, you can go uh, to our church website and pay through PayPal. Uh, you can talk to your bank, and there are a number of people in our church that do automatic uh, bank deposits. And so they just set it up in their bank online every week, and we get the checks in the mail every week. Uh, I was talking, there's a lady in our church that she wants to give during the offering time. She doesn't want to do it at home. She wants to give during the offering time in the service, but she doesn't mess with checks. And so she, what she started doing is she just got on her phone during the offering time and went to her bank and started just doing the deposit right there from her phone in the service. All kinds of things. But the, the point would be start now, start today. You know, set some time. You know, at, at 3 o'clock today, I'm going to spend a half hour working on my finances. Every night this week, at this time, I'm going to spend half an hour working on my finances. Because if you don't get it in your head what you're going to do, where you're going to start, it's going to blow by, and you're, you're going to forget about it. Build a solid financial house by listening to God, by obeying God's word, and by starting now. Start today. The challenge that we put out for the church for this November and December is, is to look at your giving. And if you have never given before, become a first-time giver. Become a first-time giver. After becoming a first-time giver, if you're a sporadic giver, the next level is, is to become a regular giver where you're giving every time you get a paycheck. If that's every week, every other week, twice a month, whatever, that you become regular in your giving. The third step is to be an obedient giver. And that's giving the first 10% of your income. And the fourth step is to be a generous giver. And a generous giver is someone who, who has already been, been obedient, but they look for opportunities that they can help out in other ways financially. And as, again, I'll encourage you, write it down. Write it down. When you start on this plan of, of dealing with your finances God's way, write down the things that happen to you. Because you're going to want to look back and see what God is doing in your life as you start to live out what he wants you to do with your finances. And it's a great testimony of God's faithfulness. I don't know if you guys watch the news a lot or not. Someone said something about being cold this morning. And I'm like, okay, whatever. Um, Buffalo, New York, got six, seven feet of snow this week. Yeah. So glad I don't live there. So, so glad I don't live there. Um, but I saw a picture. Uh, someone tweeted out a picture of these firefighters. These firefighters were going to somebody's house. Someone was, like, real sick or something. So these firefighters went to this person's house. They had to walk there because the streets are closed. They walked to this person's house and carried them on a stretcher 10 blocks to the nearest hospital. And I think about that and go, dang. I mean, I don't know how cold it was right then right there, but that's rough. And I thought about those firefighters and, like, what in the world? Why would they go out and do that? Because at some point, they made a decision that they were going to serve people. They were going to serve people. That's why they became a firefighter. And so it didn't matter that one of the worst storms that place has ever seen, that storm came through there. Those guys said, you know what? We're going to go out and do our job. We're going to take care of people. As soon as you make the decision to follow God, to serve him, storms are probably going to come. And the question is, 
Are you going to be faithful to him or not? At the end of his sermon, Jesus said, those who hear my words and put them into practice, when the storms come, their house will stand. And those who don't put it into practice, their house will crash. And the choice is ours. The choice is ours. You can hear me and love me. You can hear me and hate me. But that's your choice. You can follow God's words or you can not. That's the choice he puts out there for us. Heavenly Father, we thank you. We thank you that you love us. We thank you that you give us financial principles in your word. And I thank you that you give us a choice that we can choose to follow you or not. Because we know that when we choose to follow you, it shows us that we love you, that we trust you. And it shows you that we love you and we trust you. God, I know it's hard. I know it's scary. But I pray that you will give the people in this church the courage, the courage to stand with you during the good times and the bad. And that you'll help them, help them see you work in their lives. It's in Jesus' name I pray.